can everybody hear me okay? Um, yes, yes, okay, that's fine. All right, so we'll get cracking then. Um, so we've got about an hour. Um, we're gonna just cover a couple of topics within arrhythmias. So let's give me a minute. Computer's a bit slow to start. There we go. Okay. So the things we're going to look at first is um, looking a bit about atrial fibrillation, um, about the pathophysiology, investigations, and different management options. So rate versus control. And then we'll briefly look at torsades to points, how to um, interpret it on an ECG, and also about some of the basic principles behind management. Um, also doing the same thing for bradycardias and bradyarrhythmias. And then we'll have a look at BTVF and how that fits into the ALS algorithm and sort of the things that you need to know for your exams um, and also clinical practice. And then we'll finish on um, just being able to distinguish the different types of heart block um, and being able to interpret these also on ECG. So, you know, it's quite um, a heavy session. There's a lot of um, ECG changes and things like that to sort of look out for. I've tried to simplify it as much as possible. Um, but obviously, you know, I welcome any feedback. The feedback uh, link is in the uh, chat function. So, you know, if you do have any ideas on how it can be improved, do let me know. So we'll start off with um, some questions. Um, and now Shin will kindly put up the poll on screen and you'll have about 45 seconds or so to answer the poll. And then we'll go through the question and the bit of theory behind the diagnosis, okay? So here's your first question. Twenty seconds left. Okay, so um, I just had a question about how long the session lasts. It should last about around 50 minutes with an extra sort of 10 minutes for questions. Um, I did also forget to say, if you pop questions into the Q&A function, um, we can answer them at the end. So with this question, um, about 56% of you went for B and the second most common answer being D. So bisoprolol followed by amiodarone. So B was the correct answer. Most of you did get that. So I will delve into the specifics um, about when we choose rate control, such as bisoprolol, versus when we choose rhythm control, such as amiodarone. And then we can come back to the question if there's still any um, questions after that. So thinking about atrial fibrillation, you know, it's really important to understand what is it. So atrial fibrillation is when uh, all of the impulses are not properly conducted from the atria to the ventricles. And so as a result, you don't get full atrial contraction. So if you imagine the heart pumping, you know, as a normal heartbeat, your atria should be contracting fully um, and your atrium should be pushing blood through the ventricles and through the chambers of the heart. In atrial fibrillation, the chambers um, are sort of fibrillating. And by that, I mean, they're sort of having mini, you know, lots of mini contractions. But that means that blood flow is interrupted and it's not fully, um, you know, conducting these impulses to the ventricles. And um, AF is actually one of the most common arrhythmias that you find in clinical practice. And it's, it's actually quite often found in um, elderly people as well. So it's really important, you know, even when you're doing general medical checks, to always check uh, whether somebody's pulse is irregular. So uncontrolled AF, it can result in symptomatic palpitations and, as I've mentioned, inefficient cardiac function. And it's really important because... As the atria not contracting properly, it means that blood is not being pumped around. And so you have stagnant blood. And that's why you have an increased risk of stroke where blood can clot off and go to the brain um, and cause things like stroke. So that's why it's such an important diagnosis to make. And that's why it's um, really important that we think about anticoagulation and stroke risk and things like that. 
So thinking about how do we classify it? Well, there's actually a few ways of classifying this. And this is sort of the way that encompasses, uh, you know, the most the common terms that you find in clinical practice. So the first episode, it's really important to know whether this is a patient that's known to have AF or a patient that um, has gone into AF. And, you know, if it's a patient with new AF, then you need to think about what's actually caused that, which we will come on to. So first detective episode, it's irrespective of whether it's symptomatic or not, whether it's self-terminating, whether it was incidental finding, um, you know, it's still a first detected episode that needs further management and investigation. So recurrent episodes, this is when a patient has had two or more episodes of AF. Um, if the episodes of AF terminate spontaneously, then it's called proxismal AF. And these typically last less than 24 hours, although the actual definition is an episode lasting less than seven days. But in clinical practice, they often, you know, self-terminating within the same 24 hours, so within a day. Persistent AF is anything that's lasted greater than seven days. So um, AF that's, you know, cons consistently there, it hasn't resolved at all during this period, that's known as persistent AF. Permanent AF is if you've attempted to cardiovert this patient um, and the patient is still in AF, that's permanent AF, also known as refractory AF. So treatment goals in this sort of patient would be to think about rate control and again, anticoagulation. So thinking about some of the um, clinical features of AF, you know, the typical cardiac um, clinical features of palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, dyspnea, and of course, on examination, that irregular pulse. But it's also important to note that patients might not have any symptoms at all, and they might um, present with, you know, something completely unrelated, and you might find that they're in AF on an ECG, so they're not always symptomatic with it. You will hear the term fast AF sort of floating around. Um, and just for those who don't know, that means when you have atrial fibrillation with a fast ventricular rate, so you have tachycardia as well. And that's obviously something that's going to increase your rate of, you know, thromboemboli and things like that. So it's really important to um, look at things like what are the rate of the patient, what's the clinical condition of a patient. So thinking about some of the causes, um, you'd want to do, you know, routine blood tests. You want to check thyroid function. Uh, you know, is a patient in thyrotoxicosis or something that's precipitated this? Uh, you know, are they anemic? Um, what are their renal function? You know, do they have abnormal potassium levels that can potentiate arrhythmias? You know, or has a patient started recent medications and things like LFTs and coag screens? They're always really good to start anyway, in case you're going to start a patient on medication and you need to have these sort of blood tests done anyway as baseline. And then you can think about, you know, obviously an ECG, a chest x-ray, have they got infection? Has that precipitated this patient to go into AF? Are they particularly dehydrated and that's why they're in AF? So it's really important not to just, you know, see AF and think about treating it. It's very important to try and understand why is this patient in AF if they're not known to be and is there like a reversible cause or a treatable cause? So then the, the big question is, how do we treat it? Well, we urgently admit patients um, for emergency cardioversion if they have signs and symptoms of hemodynamic instability. And you'll hear this phrase quite often, you know, throughout this presentation when talking about arrhythmias. And things that constitute hemodynamic instability are things like tachycardia, you know, heart rate over 150 with a low blood pressure, systolic less than 90. If a patient has syncope, which by definition is a loss of consciousness or severe dizziness, or they have ongoing chest pain, increasing breathlessness, if they're shocked, these sort of things constitute hemodynamic instability. And that makes you think that they need a higher level of care, such as cardioversion, you know, um, acute medical bed, potentially HDU bed as well. And there's two main ways of managing patients with AF. You'll have heard of rate and rhythm control and how we distinguish, um, you know, what we're starting. And then also thinking long term about reducing the stroke risk. So the two main strategies that we have to deal with the arrhythmia part of atrial fibrillation is rate and rhythm control. 
So rate control is basically just accepting that the pulse is going to be irregular, but we're going to slow the rate down to avoid the negative effects on the, on the heart. Whereas the rhythm control is aiming to actually get that patient back into normal sinus rhythm. And rhythm control can be one of two things. It can be pharmacological, so using drugs, or it can be synchronized, and that's using like direct current electrical shocks. So for many years, the actual main approach was to try and maintain patients in sinus rhythm. And so essentially a lot of patients were used, uh, were mainly using um, rhythm control. Whereas now the approach for the last sort of 20 years or so is actually to use a rate control strategy. And that's what NICE advocate. So they say we should be using a rate control strategy, except in a number of specific situations, such as if a patient has coexistent heart failure, if it's the first episode of AF, or if there's an obvious reversible cause, such as infection or dehydration. So thinking about what are the options then if we're going for rate control? Well, we can use a beta blocker or a rate limiting calcium channel blocker. So that's normally diltiazem or verapamil. And it's really important to make sure you take a good drug history and make sure there's no contraindications to these drugs. And let's say you're in the position where you've tried one of these medications, but the rate's still not adequately controlled. You can obviously then try further doses of that same medication, or you can try combination therapy. So you could add a beta blocker with something like digoxin. Thinking about rhythm control. So as I've already mentioned, this is to, um, you know, a certain subgroup of patients if they uh, have coexistent heart failure, first onset AF. And when considering cardioversion, you know, it's really important to remember that that moment when a patient switches from AF to sinus, to sinus rhythm, so that moment when you're actually cardioverting them, that's actually when they're at highest risk of developing an embolism, which leads to a stroke. So if you think about, you know, this fibrillating atrium that's not properly contracting, and then you're having this thrombus that's then pushed out when your sinus rhythm's restored, leading to a stroke. And so for this reason, if a patient's only had a short duration of symptoms, let's say less than 48 hours, then you need to think about whether the rhythm control can wait until that patient is properly anticoagulated, unless they're already on anticoagulant. So it's something that you need to bear in mind if pursuing rhythm control. And that's why I've um, mentioned on the slide, you know, referral to a cardiologist because this isn't something that you tend to rush into. So, you know, rate limiting beta blockers, um, uh, rate limiting calcium channel blockers, these are really good in patients who are elderly, um, who often, you know, are found to be in AF. And there's a, always a lot of confusion about what do, what do we do with digoxin? Well, digoxin is good for patients who have coexistent heart failure, but it tends to be used for people who are very sedentary. So they don't do a lot of physical exercise, they're elderly, they're sort of, you know, housebound or don't get out very much. Um, and that's the sort of patients that we use digoxin for. So we'll just briefly talk about um, the stroke risk. I'm sure many of you have come across the CHADVAS scoring. It is something that's really important to know. You know, some patients with AF are at very low risk. And it's very important to use tools such as Chad Vask and Hasbled to, you know, really think about your anticoagulation strategy and your bleeding risk. So if a patient scores zero, then it essentially means you don't need to treat them with any uh, anticoagulation. Obviously, you take everything with the patient's clinical history. You know, if they've had, you know, a, a previous stroke or recurrent DVTs, PEs, obviously that's mentioned on this. Um, but if you take into account their family history, something that's not a part of this, you know, you tailor each therapy to individual patients. But this is a guide and this is what we tend to follow. So if you score a one in females, we tend to say this means no treatment because they only reach a score of one because of their gender. And in males, we consider anticoagulation. In if they have a score of two or more, then NICE recommends we should be offering patients a choice of anticoagulation. And so that can be warfarin or the NOAX. And these days, I don't really see anybody that we tend to start on warfarin. 
I think the NOACs are a lot easier to initiate. You don't require a lot of monitoring of INR. You don't require any monitoring of INR actually for NOACs. Um, you know, obviously they do have their own disadvantages where there's not specific antidotes if a patient comes in an overdose, but they do seem to be a lot safer um, and a lot easier to monitor. And there's a lot less interactions with other medications as well. So I'll just move on to the next question. Um, we'll give you another 30, 45 seconds just to read the question. Okay, so 50% of you went for D, and then it's fairly split between the rest of the answers. So the correct answer is, in fact, if I can get to it, bear with me. The correct answer is, in fact, D. So to faster points, you know, it's a rare ventricular tachycardia. You don't see it very often um, in clinical practice, but it's a very important diagnosis to be aware about because it does require prompt treatment. So torsades points, um, it essentially, the actual definition, uh, translation of torsades is twisting of the point. So it's a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which essentially shows a QRS complex twisting around the isoelectric baseline. So the peaks, which are at first pointing upwards, are then pointing downwards. So you can see on this ECG where you have this sort of twisting about the baseline where the peaks are pointing both up and down. And that's characteristic of torsades. So torsades to point by nature is hemodynamically unstable and it often causes a sudden drop in blood pressure which often presents with dizziness and syncope. And most individuals who have an episode of this do revert to sinus rhythm within a few seconds. But if they don't, it typically persists and can possibly degenerate into VF, ventricular fibrillation. And that's why it's really important. You know, VF is one of the shockable rhythms as part of the ALS algorithm. And so it's really important that if a patient is progressing and worsening in their clinical condition, then you need to treat it, you know, as quickly as possible to prevent them requiring um, emergency treatment in a cardiac arrest situation. So the most effective treatment for torsades is cardioversion. And this is basically, you know, as we've mentioned, applying electrical current across the heart to temporarily stop and resynchronize the cardiac myocytes. The treatment is to prevent recurrent torsades um, is to infuse magnesium, which is what the last question was um, adhering to and to correct any electrolyte imbalances such as low potassium and withdrawing medications which can prolong the QT interval. So it's about taking that whole approach and not just um, treating you know, one thing, it's thinking about their medication history if they have any other uh, electrolyte abnormalities. So on this ECG, um, you, know, you typically will find a tachycardia, an irregular rhythm, there's no clearly defined P waves. There's no clearly defined PR interval. And the QRS width can vary. So you have a progressive QRS in terms of height, width, and also axis, which is when it's twisting about the point. So facing both north and south. Somebody's asked if I can show with the cursor, of course. So if we look at the lead one, you can see this is the isoelectric line. So this is your um, you know, standard isoelectric line that normally flows across here. And that's um, where you would see your P, your QRS and your T wave. So twisting about the point means it's going upwards and you're seeing a point of the QRS. 
and then the QRS is pointing down. So you can see that in um, pretty much all of these leads actually where it's going up and then pointing down. And this is characteristic of Pulsar, so you don't find it in any other condition. So as we mentioned, um, you know, it lowers your blood pressure. It can often lead to syncope, which is loss of consciousness and VF. And it can be caused by certain medications. So it's really important to, again, take that drug history. But it can also be associated with a, a range of other things, such as long QT syndrome, malnutrition, alcohol abuse. So IV magnesium is to prevent you having further torsades. And cardioversion is the most effective treatment to terminate torsades. So I'll just double check if there's any more questions about torsades in particular. Um, somebody's asked if we'll have a link for the recording. So they will be on YouTube um, and you can find them afterwards. Um, just to clarify, for rhythm control, they do say anticoagulation needs to be for 48 hours, and that's to prevent the risk of a thrombus going to uh, the brain and causing a stroke. So I'll move on to the next question, and again, about 45 seconds or so to answer. Okay, so about 50% of people went for E and 25% went for A. So most of you, half of you got this right, the correct answer being E. So this is a patient um, who's known to be in bradycardia and the resource council actually have very good guidelines um, about a lot of arrhythmias actually, and I would urge you to check them out. So the Research Council guidelines for the management of bradycardia, they say that it depends on whether a patient is hemodynamically compromised and whether there's a risk of them, you know, developing into a rhythm such as asystole. And so we need to think about, do they meet the factors for hemodynamic compromise, as we mentioned before, which are the shock, syncope, heart failure and ischemia. And if they do, um, that will obviously change the management. So firstly, just thinking about what is bradycardia? Well, it's a slowing of the heart rate, less than 60 beats per minute, and patients can present with dizziness, syncope, tiredness, um, you know, and it's important to think about whether a patient has a normally naturally lower heart rate for them. So people who live in higher altitudes or people who are athletes, they tend to have a lower resting heart rate. And often these people will know this, you know, they'll have had this question before and it will have been elicited in their history, but it's always important to ask these sorts of questions as well. So the important thing, you know, when starting the management of any condition is to think about the potential causes. So have they taken medications which have slowed the heart rate, things such as beta blockers, which we can give, um, you know, antidotes to. Um, atropine, again, we do give it. So that's if there's any adverse features. So the way that I like to remember these adverse features is with the um, acronym HISS, H-I-S-S, -S, and that stands for heart failure, ischemia, shock, and syncope. It's just a nice, easy way of remembering what are the adverse features of any arrhythmia that makes you think they might need a higher level of treatment. So the standard dose for atropine is 500 micrograms IV. Um, it's very short acting, so often they will require repeat doses. And if there's an inadequate response to atropine, then you can also think about alternative drugs, 
such as um, glucagon if there's a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker overdose or adrenaline. And if there's, um, you know, severe refractory cases, you can think about transcutaneous pacing as an interim measure whilst waiting for a permanent pacemaker. So these are sort of the stages that we go through. And just to talk a little bit about atropine. So atropine actually blocks the vagus nerve and how the vagus nerve works on the heart specifically. And that's why it increases the rate of firing at the sinoatrial node. But often you need to give repeat boluses. It is very short acting and you can give repeat boluses up to three milligrams. Just um, looking at a few of the questions, um, I won't be covering the classes of antiarrhythmic drugs. This is just something that you sit down and look at, um, you know, examples of the antiarrhythmic drugs and the mechanism of action. It's something that you just need to have a look at, you know, get to grips with and learn. Um, quite a few of you, the questions have already been answered. I'm sorry you weren't able to see my mouse. Um, I don't know how to correct that, unfortunately. But if you have a look online, there's a lot of examples of ECGs. A particular good website is Life in the Fast Lane. If you want to delve a little bit deeper into ECG changes and how they relate to any of these, that's often where I get mine from. Um, and so that's often a good point to start at. So thinking about the ALS algorithm for bradycardias, so obviously we always start with our A to E approach, we're trying IV access and bloods, treat any reversible causes, and then we come on to the HIST, are there any adverse features of heart failure, ischemia, shock and syncope? If there aren't, then you think about, is there a risk of this arrhythmia developing into something else? So is there a risk that this might develop into complete heart block, which is a clinical emergency? And if there isn't, then you can think about observing the patient and, you know, maybe admission to see if they do deteriorate and they might need input or whether there's a reversible cause that's later identified on blood tests or chest. If there are adverse features, then we proceed with the IV atropine. If they don't respond to that, like I've said before, you can repeat the IV atropine up until a maximum of three milligrams. Or you can consider transcutaneous pacing, or you can think about alternative drugs such as adrenaline or glucagon um, and things like that. But I think if you're getting to this later stage, generally that's when you would have um, intensive care support, you'd have um, input from a cardiologist. So you wouldn't be expected to manage anything as serious as this, uh, but it's just important to have a general understanding. So we'll move on to the next question. Okay, just to answer a few questions. Um, somebody mentioned, I thought it would be pacing as the heart rate slightly low. The heart rate is low, but I hope you can appreciate from the algorithm that we've just been through. We start with atropine, regardless um, if there are adverse features. And then the second line management depends on how severe the patient is. Typically, you wouldn't rush straight into pacing. You need to think about that's quite an invasive procedure to have. Um, transcutaneous pacing versus trying further atropine. So in clinical practice, um, the best thing to do would be to try atropine at least a few repeated doses. And by that point, you'd have spoken to the relevant spe specialities such as intensive care and cardiology. Um, there are a few questions about anticoagulation. In AF, if you do rate control, when do you anticoagulate? So it's the same for rhythm control in the sense that you do the CHADVAS score. And if they score two or more, 
um, or if they score one or more and they're female, you consider it. So typically we say two or more to keep it easy. Um, and that's when you think about anticoagulation, no wax versus warfarin. Somebody else mentioned why is the sex of a patient um, in a category of CHADVASC if their score must be over zero for males and over one to offer them anticoagulation? The reason is, is because if a patient has other risk factors, and typically they do, you don't tend, you don't tend to see patients without comorbidities, um, then the, being a female scores you one as a higher risk. And if they do score one, and it's just for being a female, typically we wouldn't offer anticoagulation. If they don't, haven't had any previous strokes or PIAs, or they've not had any PEs, DVTs, or they're not known to have ischemic heart disease, we typically wouldn't offer them, but it's just something that we consider. There's no hard and fast rules with scoring systems. It's about taking into account the entire picture of a patient. So there's no sort of, um, you know, if they score one and they're female, they need, they must be anticoagulated. It's more of a considerate, you know, are there any other risk factors that aren't included in the CHADFAS score? Because, you know, every score has its own limitations. And it's about thinking about the patient holistically as a whole and making, reaching that decision. And it typically wouldn't be you reaching that decision. It'd be like a senior acute medical consultant or cardiologist. So moving on to the next question. Um, this is a patient who's in VT. Um, the answers are fairly split between A and B, cardioversion and amiodarone. Um, but most of you, 46% went for amiodarone. So the correct answer is actually A, cardioversion. Bear with me. There we go. So the patient um, has a ventricular tachycardia and they also have signs of hemodynamic compromise. So hypotension is a sign of somebody being in shock. And that's why um, cardioversion is the right answer in this case. VT is a broad complex tachycardia. And you know, if treated rapidly, it has a favorable outcome. But if the patient was in VF or pulseless VT, then you'd think about defibrillation. So for those of you who went for that, you're thinking more about the ALS algorithm um, and about defib. That's if a patient doesn't have a pulse. But in this question, it says the patient is sweating, he's got creps, he's, you know, his observations are, you know, consistent with somebody who's, who's got a pulse and is, is alive and with us. So the most common indication for cardioversion um, is actually unstable AF, atrial flutter and supraventricular tachycardias. And it's important to think about when we do synchronized cardioversion versus unsynchronized cardioversion, because you might see some of these terms in your exams and they can be a little bit confusing. So somebody's actually just asked this question. So synchronized cardioversion is a low energy shock and that uses a sensor to deliver electricity at a specific point within the cardiac cycle. And it's typically at the peak of the QRS complex. So the machine is able to recognize when you're reaching the highest point of the R wave. And when you engage that sync option on a defibrillator and you push the shock button, there'll be an actual delay in shock. And during the delay, so this pause, the machine is reading the ECG rhythm and it synchronizes the shock so that it can be delivered with or just after the R wave in a patient's QRS complex. And this is typically for things like unstable AF, atrial flutter, um, SVPs. And if medications fail in a stable patient, then you can think about synchronized cardioversion. Now, unsynchronized cardioversion is defibrillation. This is a high energy shock, and this is delivered as soon as the shock button is pushed on a defibrillator. So that means that the shock can fall randomly anywhere within the cardiac cycle, so anywhere within the QRS complex. And unsynchronized cardioversion, i.e. defibrillation, is typically used when there's no coordinated electrical activity in the heart. So, you know, the atria and the ventricles, they're contracting completely independently. And this is typically in VF or pulseless VT, so your shockable rhythms. And... These can also be used if a defibrillator fails to synchronize a patient in an unstable patient. So these are for the most unwell patients and it's very high energy shock. And that's the most important thing to remember. So a few people went for amiodarone. Um, 
Amiodarone is used in patients with VT, but it's not first line in hemodynamically unstable VT. So if medical ther uh, therapy fails, if a patient is stable, then we can consider, you know, progressing back to the cardio version. But if a patient is unstable, it's important to know what first line management is. So this is an example um, of VT and ventricular tachycardia is really important to recognize because it can impair your cardiac output. You know, the heart is beating so fast, it can cause hypotension, collapse, acute cardiac failure. And this is due to the, you know, extremely high heart rate. There's a lack of coordination with the atria. And so this, you know, with coexisting poor ventricular function, if somebody has heart failure or ischemic heart disease, you know, it can lead to really significantly decreased cardiac output, which can then lead to decreased myocardial perfusion. And then this can precipitate um, VF. So this is an example of a simple ventricular tachycardia. You can see it's a monomorphic, um, you know, all the QRSs are the same size, same width. It's very fast rhythm. And if this was um, polymorphic, so there were QRSs of different sizes, then that is, you need to think about whether that's something like torsades, which is something we've already come across. So what is VT? Well, it's a broad complex tachycardia. Um, it's typically defined as a heart rate of more than 100 and a QRS width of more than 120. And there are many causes of VT, whether it's electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia, or whether um, a patient's had a myocardial infarction, or whether they've precipitated VT because of the use of antiarrhythmic drugs. And so you need to think, is a patient stable or unstable? So, Thinking about the duration, um, if it's sustained, then it's lasting over 30 seconds or it's requiring intervention due to hemodynamic compromise. And a non-sustained means that it's terminating by itself within 30 seconds. And thinking about, you know, how are we going to manage these patients? If we go back to our HIS acronym, do they have heart failure? Do they have myocardial ischemia? Do they have shock? Do they have syncope? If they have any of these features, then we need to think about cardioversion and giving them that shock. If they're stable, then as half of you rightly said, we would go for the IV amiodarone. So we have got quite a few questions, so I'll just try and answer a few as we go along. Why are they hemodynamically unstable? So in this case, the patient was hypotensive, and you know a shock a, a shocked patient is typically hypotensive, tachycardic. We know they're tachycardic because they're in VT, so they've already got two signs of shock. Other signs could be things like syncope, dizziness, and things like this are all pointing to a diagnosis of shock. So thinking about that HIS acronym. And uh, that's why this patient would be a candidate for cardioversion. So amiodarone can be um, a form of pharm pharmacological cardioversion. But if it if an exam question says just cardioversion, they typically mean DC cardioversion, which is direct current cardioversion, which is essentially electrical cardioversion. And so that's why I actually put it as just cardioversion in this question just to get you thinking about sort of the differences. So that's a very good point actually, and I'm glad that you asked that. How do you know when to cardiovert and when to defibrillate? So we did briefly just go over this. So we are defibrillating a patient if they're in a shockable rhythm. So a patient who is in pulseless VT or in VF is a shockable rhythm that would require unsynchronized cardioversion, i.e. defibrillation. And then cardioversion is used for any patient who is hemodynamically unstable. That, that one. 
is there a difference between hemodynamic compromise and hemodynamically unstable? No, there's no difference at all. They both mean exactly the same thing. Um, okay, fine. I think we've done a few, so we'll move on and we'll sort of answer a couple as we're going along and any we don't get to, we'll answer at the end. So next question, again, about 45 seconds. If you do need to see the ECG a bit bigger, I have got it on another slide, so just let me know. Okay, so most people, about 88% of people have gone for B, which is VF. So let me, bear with me, it's a little bit slow. So that's the correct answer, well done to most of you. Um, so VF is important shockable cardiac arrest rhythm. This basically is, you know, similar to what we mentioned earlier with atrial fibrillation. It's a rapid and irregular electrical activity. So the ventricles are not contracting in a synchronized manner. And so that leads to loss of cardiac output, which often explains why a patient is unresponsive. And that's how they're often found. And VF is actually the leading cause of cardiac arrest out of hospital. And so it's very important to be able to recognize it on an ECG and to be able to treat it. So VF and pulseless VT, as we've already mentioned, they fall under the category of shockable rhythms. VF is when the ventricles contract in a rapid and uncoordinated manner. So they're not contracting properly, they're fibrillating, they're doing um, multiple, you know, a lot of smaller contractions, which is not properly pumping the blood around the body. And so this is leading to a loss of cardiac output and can be rapidly fatal. So the treatment for this is CPR and defibrillation. And then um, these are the mainstays of treatment. But if it persists, then we think about whether we need to give amiodarone, which is typically 300 milligrams IV, um, or adrenaline, which is one milligrams um, IV of one in 10,000. And these are typically after the third shock has been delivered. But amiodarone is a one-off dose and adrenaline is repeated every other cycle. So it would be cycle three, five, seven, et cetera. It's really important to know these as this is something that can commonly come up. So how do we treat VF or pulseless VT? So first thing to do is confirm the cardiac arrest, obviously check for signs of life, um, abnormal breathing or cessation of breathing. And if you've confirmed the arrest, then put out the, um, you know, double two, double two, call the resuscitation team um, and then start chest compressions. And um, thinking about getting the rhesus trolley, hopefully you're in a hospital environment where um, some of the nurses and some of the other team can help put on the pads and the leads whilst chest compressions are ongoing. And then you start to think about um, what are your reversible, non-reversible causes, so your H's and your T's, and also about when we're giving medications. So I've just um, laid it out quite simply um, on the side of this slide. Um, when we give medications. So after the third shock, you resume chest compressions. So you don't wait to give medication. After the shock's been delivered, you jump straight back onto the chest because without chest compressions, the blood is not pumping um, through the heart and through the body. So you need to make sure that that's the first thing that's done. Then at this point, the medication should already be prepared. You give um, adrenaline at one milligrams IV, amiodarone 300 milligrams IV, and then do a further two minutes of CPR, you stop, you reassess. And if a patient um, is still in the same rhythm and they're receiving further shocks, you then give adrenaline um, every other shock. So it's approximately every three to five minutes. 
and it would be every, after the third shock, after the fifth, after the seventh shock. Um, obviously, between um, each cycle of CPR, each two minute cycle, you need to stop, reassess the rhythm, reassess the pulse, um, and see if they are still in a shockable rhythm or if they've um, developed ROSC or if they've um, gone into a non shockable rhythm, such as PEA or asystole. So it can be a little bit confusing. Um, I would recommend spending some time on the Resource Council website um, because it does um, it does lay out very clearly and very easily. And sort of once you've got your head around it, it does start to make a bit more sense as well. But I think they have a lot of nice diagrams on their website, so I would definitely recommend having a look at those as well. So we'll just move on to the last question. Um, again, give you another 45 seconds or so. Okay, so this one's fairly split. Um, you've got 40% going for C, which is second degree Mobitz 2, um, with the next most common answers being B and D. So heart block is one of those things that often um, confuses people, and it's something that you need to be able to identify on an ECG and to be able to define, really. So just the correct answer is C. So in this question, it's telling you that the PR interval um, is constant. There's intermittently non-conducted P waves and there's no sign of PR elongation or shortening of the waves. So that means the PR interval is the same throughout, but there are intermittently non-conducted P waves. And that is the definition of Mobitz type two heart block. So I've laid it out on this slide. Um, what the, um, the definitions are. So first degree heart block is prolonged PR interval and it's typically benign. Um, it's constant pr prolonged PR interval and um, it typically doesn't cause any problems. And it's caused by prolongation of the conduction um, through the atrial ventricular node. And it can be identified on an ECG by finding a PR interval over 200 milliseconds. It can be caused due to an acute MI, it can be choose, uh, due to electrolyte abnormalities such as hyperkalemia, or in patients such as athletes who have high vagal tone. And it's typically benign, it doesn't always need treating, um, but any underlying cause of it should be reversed. So moving on to Mobitz type 1, also known as the Wenkeback phenomenon. So this is a type of second degree heart block. So second degree heart block can either be Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2. And it's characterized by progressive lengthening of the PR interval, which results in a P wave that fails to conduct QRS. So you end up dropping the P wave. And causes of this can be MI, it can be certain drugs such as beta blockers or digoxin. Again, it can be due to professional athletes or um, if a patient has myocarditis, but it's also generally asymptomatic. It does not require any specific management as the risk of actually going into complete heart block is quite low. But if a patient is symptomatic, then they might need ECG monitoring and they might need further investigation by a cardiology specialist to look at why they're in this rhythm. And if, um, if they are, you know, bradycardic, then do they require um, additional management such as atropine? But typically, they don't require um, any further management, especially if they're asymptomatic, which they normally are. Mobitz type 2. So this is a, the second type of um, second degree 
AV block where there's an intermittently non-conductive P wave. So in this, it's important to recognize that the PR interval is constant and there may be no fixed pattern or fixed ratio such as you know a two to one or a three to one block and it's usually caused by a failure in the conduction system and in most cases there's a broad QRS which is um, you know leading to this um, arrhythmia and the only real definitive management for this is with a permanent pacemaker because with this rhythm they're at a very high risk of going into complete heart block and becoming unstable, becoming very unwell with it. And the one that we worry about the most, and we worry about patients in any of the other types of heart block going into this is complete heart block. And this is when the atrial impulses fail to be conducted to the ventricles. So there's a complete disjunction between the atria and the ventricles, which is why you see complete disjunction between the P waves and the QRS complexes. So there's no relationship between them. So this can lead to, you know, fa failure in cardiac output, and that can be due to a progression of a Mobitz type 2, for example. And that's why we tend to worry about the last two more so. These patients might present with a syncope, they might present in an arrest, um, an ECG will typically show a bradycardia, a very severe one with complete dissociation between the P waves and the QRS complexes. Again, it can be due to causes such as a myocardial infarction, especially inferior MIs, um, and certain drugs that act on the AV nodes, such as beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Definitive management is a permanent pacemaker because these patients are at risk of sudden death. So it's a really important diagnosis. It will be managed by a cardiology specialist. Um, and it's very important that these are picked up, but often they do present very, very unwell. So I've just got a slide just um, listing the different types and an example of what it would look like on an ECG. So the first degree heart block, we have a PR interval over 0.2 seconds. Um, typically asymptomatic doesn't require treatment. We have a Mobitz um, type 2 AV block where you're typically um, not, you're having a P wave, which is then not followed by a QRS complex. And then you're having a two to one block where you can see there are um, complexes that again are dropped. And then a third degree block where there's complete no association between the P waves and QRS complexes. So that's the end of the presentation. All right, welcome any questions. I know there's still quite a few in the chat. Um, I've had a few questions about the blood pressure. So I just need to go back and look actually. Um, which question? Ah, it was this one, wasn't it? I do apologize actually, that is a typo and that should read something like 84 over something. Um, I've clearly messed up. I've messed up that one there. So I do apologize that caused some confusion. And that's probably why the answers were quite split between A and B. So I'll make sure to change that. I do apologize. It was a little bit hard to keep up with the number of questions during the presentation. So apologies if I didn't get to all questions. Let me just go through them now. How can you tell the difference between torsades and VF? Okay. Um, okay, so. Uh, where's torsades? Okay, so torsades is, they're, they're both a tachycardia, okay? That's the first thing to know. It's a very fast heart rate. With torsades, you're, if you're specifically looking at the QRS complexes, okay? And with torsades, you're going to see differences in the width, height, and axis of the QRS. So first thinking about the height, and I know I'm aware that you can't, I don't know if you can see my, um, my mouse now, um, I hope so. But if not, if you're looking at, um, we're looking at ECG lead one. So there's different heights in the QRS complexes. So that's the first thing. They're, none of them are regular, none of them are the same. And then there's also different widths in the QRS complexes and they're flipping on their axis. So where you can see this is pointing down, 
the QRS is not complete and it's then flipping upwards. So where you can see it's flipping down, it's then twisting on its axis and rotating the other way. Whereas in ventricular fibrillation, when something is fibrillating, let me just quickly check the chat, see whether you can actually see, oh, you can, perfect. So a fibrillation is this sort of movement where you can't define that there are any QRS complexes. You know, these are, there's no clearly defined complexes here. It's a fibrillating arrhythmia. You can't make out that there's any sinus rhythm. You can't say there's definitely P waves, Q waves. It's small, but a great number of contractions of the ventricles. And so that's why you end up with this funny rhythm that isn't twisting on its axis. It's not deep and twisting, but it's just sort of fibrillating, non-contracting. And then thinking about the patient clinically, VF patients often present in arrest or they often present um, in syncope. And so thinking about um, you know, how your patient is clinically is a part of that history and examination. But the most important thing to remember is in torsades, you'll see those big QRSs, you know, changing um, axis and twisting, and they're clearly defined QRSs. Whereas in this, you're just seeing a fibrillation across the, you know, every single lead. So it's not clearly defined. A few of these questions have already been answered in the chat. So that's good. Thank you if you've done that. Let me skip to the end as well. Um, what else? Why give amiodrone as opposed to other calcium channel blockers? That was about 7.25. Whoever answered that question, this one I've popped it up on screen, if you could just clarify which question that's in relation to, that would be very helpful. Um, they did spell my surname wrong. Well done. Thank you for noticing. Um, that's not a problem. I don't mind. Is it right to say that chronic AFib is when there is no rapid venture for RVR and acute is when there is? So AFib is not typically defined as acute and chronic. Um, if we go back to where we start. So we don't use we don't ever use the terms acute and chronic AFib. Um, I've, I've never seen those used in clinical practice. So the things that we do say is acute could be first detected episode or paroxysmal. And if you're thinking chronic, then it's persistent or permanent. So if you wanted to define it as acute and chronic, you'd have to think about um, paroxysmal or first episode versus persistent and permanent. And persistent is when one episode is lasting more than seven days. And permanent is when a patient um, has undergone attempts to be cardioverted, to try and revert them into sinus rhythm. So they've had persistent AF, they've undergone cardioversion. Or if a patient is elderly, frail, and it's made that uh, the decisions made that the patient is not fit enough to undergo cardioversion, then that's known as permanent AF. It means that they're permanently going to be in AF and it's basically refractory. There's nothing that can be done about it. And so the main goals are to know that they're going to stay in AF. So what I mean by nothing can be done about it is you can't revert them into sinus rhythm. So we're going to think about rate control and anticoagulation, which is when we discussed about differences here. Somebody's asked about the dose of Rapamil. Um, I haven't personally prescribed for Rapamil um, in A&E myself before referring to a cardiologist. If you're questioning um, a dose of Rapamil, then typically the best basis to look would be trust guidelines or the BNF. I try to avoid using the BNF where possible if things are in the trust guidelines because each trust does have slight variations. Um, and that's particularly when thinking about antibiotics and things like that. But even for routine things like this, different trusts will have different um, guidelines on what they prefer and how they do things. So it's always important to know how to access them when you're working. How do we choose rhythm versus rate control? So rate control is typically something that we use um, more often these days we used to use a lot of rhythm control but that obviously 
um, can come with the risk of having emboli that uh, go to the brain and cause a stroke. And so we typically use rate control um, in most patients. We use rhythm control if a patient is um, of a particular category. So what I mean by that, if they have coexistent heart failure, if there's an obvious reversible cause, or if it's first onset AF. So the first episode, or they've had an infection that's precipitated it, then we think more about rhythm control and rate control in most other patients. So rate control is typically what we mostly use um, and rhythm control, not as often. Okay. How can you do, do, do. How can you make a difference in CPD is the atrial How can you make a difference in sequential proximal tachycardias? I'm not too, whoever wrote this question, if you could just clarify what you mean, because I don't quite understand the question. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer that. If a patient is hemodynamically stable with the EG management for B, okay, I'll quickly go back. If anybody does need to go, by the way, um, you can fill in the uh, feedback form for me, please, in the chat function, and then um, you're welcome to, to disappear. And it will be recorded, so anything you miss, you can catch up on afterwards. I know I don't want to keep people necessarily just to answer the questions. Um, somebody's also asked in the chat um, about adrenaline and amiodarone in cardiac arrest. If you just pop all of the questions into the Q&A, um, you know, aside from that one, don't bother retyping, just because there's a lot of messages on both sides. Um, I'm also not a cardiology trainee. I'm an F3 doctor. Um, I've done a lot of acute medicine and I really enjoy acute medicine. And I've just been accepted into anesthetic training, um, which I haven't started yet. Um, adrenaline, amiodarone. Okay, I can definitely do those bits and pieces, not a problem. CT, CF. Okay, I'm just going to put these questions up and I'll go over these, not a problem. CT and VF. Okay, fine. So management of VT and VF was the two most common things that came up. So in VT, the first thing you want to know is, do they have a pulse? If they don't have a pulse, then you need to think about the NLS algorithm. And um, this is a shockable rhythm. So I'll come on to that again in a moment, because somebody's asked me to just go over that as well. If they have a pulse, so VT with a pulse, you then think about are they hemodynamically stable or unstable so you know signs of being unstable are hypotension chest you know chest pain that's unrelenting hasn't resolved at all is possibly getting worse um, are they in acute heart failure is their gcs dropped are they experiencing myocardial ischemia are they having ecg changes um and things like that so anything that is what I've mentioned um, is a sign of being unstable. And so if they're hemodynamically unstable in VT with a pulse, um, the treatment for this is electrical shock. So DC shock, di direct current shock. And that's the shock um, that we spoke about, which is synchronized. If a patient is stable, then the treatment's IV amiodarone. So quite simple. If they're stable, amiodarone. If they're unstable, shock. Um, why use amiodarone as opposed to the calcium channel blockers? Honestly, not too sure. Um, amiodarone is the most commonly used for reverting most arrhythmias back to sinus rhythm. The reason why amiodarone is used, I'm not too sure. But if you do find out, do let me know, as that's very interesting. Um, can you go to the last slide? Is his and cardioversion and its treatment applicable to all arrhythmias. It's not applicable to all arrhythmias, but it's applicable to most, and especially the um, VT um, and torsades. Um, it, it is typical, it's applicable to most of them. So essentially, if a patient's very, very unstable, then you're thinking more about cardioversion because if you have this unstable patient, you really want to go to the man the management, you know, cardioversion is essentially shocking those cardiac myocytes into restoring sinus rhythm 
And so when a patient's unstable, that means they're extremely unwell, and this is life or death situations. So that's when you're thinking about cardioversion. So last slide of ECGs, and then somebody also had mentioned about this. I'll just quickly, I don't know if you wanted to just take a picture of the last slide, um, the person who asked that. So I'll just pop it up for a few moments and then I'll go back. Few more seconds then we've got two more questions okay um and somebody also did mention about this so quickly going back over the ALS algorithm so um obviously first thing you want to do is confirm the arrest check for signs of life check for breathing uh, you know that's your doctor ABC um if you've confirmed the arrest then you call the arrest team etc so once you've started compressions, you will think about um, assessing the rhythm and you have to stop compressions to assess the rhythm. Um, because as you can imagine, the rhythm is looking at the electrical activity of the heart. If somebody's jumping on the chest, then that's obviously going to affect the rhythm. Strip. So that's why you need to stop. Um, sorry, I'm just double checking the chat. Okay. okay. Um, and then you need to think about, is this shockable? Is it non-shockable? And essentially that's the mainstay of management. So are they in VF or pulseless VT? In that case, it's a shockable rhythm. And these are non-synchronized shocks. So they're delivered at any point in the cycle um, or is it non-shockable? And if it's non-shockable, then the mainstay of treatment is to continue CPR. And after every cycle of CPR, which is two minutes, you need to stop and reassess the rhythm. So have they switched from shockable to non-shockable or vice versa? And then if they have switched to a shockable rhythm from a non-shockable, you can then deliver that shock. After you've delivered three successive shocks, then you will need to think about giving medications. So giving adrenaline and amiodarone, and that's one milligrams, 300 milligrams respectively. Adrenaline is then repeated every other shock. So every th third, fifth, seventh, ninth cycle, if, if it gets that far. After every cycle, you'll stop, you'll reassess the rhythm and um, ensure that the patient has not, you know, obtained ROSC or anything like that, or that they've not changed into a different rhythm. And at the same time, the team leader will be thinking about possible reversible causes. So looking at your four H's and your four T's. And if you've not come across those before, definitely Google those as those are all the reversible causes of cardiac arrest. It's very important to know. So I hope that clears that. Um, that one was done. Oh. And last question, how do you know if there's AF or sinus tachycardia? So let's we put an ECG in for AF. Oh, apologies if I didn't, I should have done that. Okay, AF, um, sinus tachycardia. So the definition of sinus is a sinus rhythm is when a QRS um, follows every single P wave. So I don't know if I have one I can use here. Not really, okay. Okay, now here we go. So we have, a P wave and a QRS, kind of ignoring the rest of this, um, and followed by a T wave. The definition of sinus rhythm is this bit here. Every P wave is followed by a QRS. The definition of atrial fibrillation is that there is an absence of P waves. So if you can't make out any discernible P waves, so there are no P waves, and there's often a little bit of a, what we call a chaotic baseline. Um, there are QRS complexes. That means that um, the, the patient is a atrial fibrillation. So there's no P waves at all. It's definitely need to look into um, looking at images of these. I would recommend life in the fast lane. Um, and just Googling these arrhythmias and trying to understand and get to grips with the different uh, mechanisms. I had another question come through. Can you explain after the third shock when we look for the causes, the three H's, et cetera? So with every single cardiac arrest scenario, there will be 
um, a team leader. And as a part of that, you, I just realized that the four H's and four T's are at the bottom here, if you've not seen them before. Um, as the team leader, you'll be overseeing the management of the cardiac arrest. And so that involves uh, making sure people are, um, you know, gaining access and sending off bloods, doing gases and uh, making sure the medications are prepared and delivered. And as a part of that, it's thinking about all of the reversible causes. So you might need to look into the notes, gain some history from the nurses. And that's sort of done, um, you know, as soon as possible, really. So if you come to an arrest situation, you typically don't know anything about the patient. Let's say a patient is a COBD patient. They've, um, you know, typically requiring high levels of oxygen. Um, they're probably not getting enough. If they've got pneumonia on top of that, then they're poorly perfused. Then you can think about is hypoxia a cause, you know, has this patient been without oxygen for whatever reason? Were they agitated? Have they knocked their oxygen off? And thinking about these sorts of things is something that you do immediately as part of the arrest situation. You know, when you attend arrest, typically one of the ward nurses will already be starting the compressions. Somebody will always be um, attaching the defibrillator. So it's that role of the team leader to take that step back and to think about the reversible causes. And things like hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, you know, you need to do a gas for that. You need to do um, a venous blood gas, arterial blood gas to see um, if the patient does have any electrolyte abnormalities that have put them into one of these rhythms. And so that team leader's responsibility is to make sure that the whole process moves through very smoothly. Um, if you also go onto the Resource Council website, they actually lay it out in steps. It goes from like one to 20, 25 odd. You know, you can really see in a lot of detail um, each step of the cardiac arrest situation. And I think if, on YouTube, there are also some videos and things as well that you can look at about how a cardiac arrest situation is run and typically sort of how it will feel in clinical practice. So I hope that answers all of your questions. Thank you very much for everybody who stayed till the end. Um, and I really welcome any feedback that anybody has. Um, and I think that's everything from me. If Naushin would like to say anything else. Yeah, I just want to thank you very much for that session. It was an amazing session, very thorough. Um, so really appreciate it. Um, yes, everyone, this is going to be recorded and hopefully up on the website, um, study our website within seven days um, and up on Quesmed's YouTube channel. Please do fill in the feedback form. You have a chance to enter the monthly raffle as well if you do. But I think other than that, thank you very much, Manji. Um, and I think that's, that's the end of our session. Hope everyone enjoyed. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening.